Baruchem Aboyim. Thank you very much for attending. Welcome to our home. The um, lecture this week on uh, my thoughts, uh, I think it's an important concept of nothing is an accident. So as I look back on my life and the journey I've taken, uh, it really brings a smile to my face. Somehow, with the help of God, Baruch Hashem, all the pieces fit. But interestingly enough, not in the way that I imagined that they would. As the saying goes, a man plans and God laughs. All the experiences that we have in our lives, though they may seem irrelevant, are all orchestrated by the hand of God. Nothing is an accident. If we look into the Torah, we see this fact played out again and again. I'm sure that Noah never thought that his mission in life would be connected to being a master carpenter. God tells him to build an ark, and it takes him 120 years, and through the years, pardon me, it takes him 120 years. Through the years, <laughs> I've had a few contractors who graduated from the same trade school that he did, LOL. Now, nowhere does it state that Noah hired workers or that anyone helped him in his task of building the ark. He built the ark by himself. He became exactly what he needed to be, a master carpenter. After all, when he stepped out of the ark after the flood, he was greeted with emptiness and void. What he saw was total devastation. Not one building was standing. Nothing of the previous world remained. It now became his job, his responsibility, to rebuild a whole new world. But he knew something about building. After all, he had built the ark himself. Without being told to do so, God had prepared him for his ultimate mission, the rebuilding of a new world from the ground up. Let us look into the life of Avram Avinu, Abraham our father. He tried to bring monotheism to the world. His reward was that he was thrown into a fiery furnace by King Nimrod. He survives, though his brother, who was also thrown into the same fiery furnace, dies. Immediately after this incident, God tells him, Lech Lecha, leave your country, leave your birthplace, and leave your father's house. But why? Of course, Amravino had a mission to spread the word of God in the world. Now, one would have thought that after being saved from a fiery furnace, that he would be looked upon as a superstar in his city. Why leave and go someplace else where no one knows you? Take advantage of your notoriety. After all, he had earned his credibility, his superstar status. One would have thought that people would have listened to and even followed the person who had miraculously lived to an experience that killed everyone else who had been subjected to it, even his own brother. What was God's reasoning for telling Avram Vino to travel to a new and different destination where he was totally unknown? The way that Avram Vino was able to influence other people in the ways of God was to be, so to speak, the first Howard Johnsons. He would set up his tent on the road and offer hospitality to wayfarers. As you read in the opening verses of the portion of Vayera, where he hosts the three travelers, uh, again, angels, the Medrash tells us that he had four doors open to his tent, one in each direction of the compass, to make it easier for guests to enter his abode. Avravinu treated them all royally. While they partook of his hospitality, he would tell them about the one and only God in the world, and that they should serve him. When they had finished their meal, who had asked them to offer praise to God, again, for the kindness extended. If they agreed, then the meal, pardon me, the meal and the accommodations were free. If they refused, huh, then he would present them with an exorbitant bill. He would then tell them, pray or pay. So why did God tell them to travel? You know, they tell a story of Reb Nachum of Chernobyl, he had taken upon himself the mission of what we call Pidyan Shvuyim, redeeming captives. He would try to help people who have been thrown into prison by the landowners, the parrots, for not paying their rents. Now, one day he found himself in jail. And when one of his students came to visit him, Reb Nachum said to the student that he knew that nothing in the world is an accident. So why was he in prison? And the student told Reb Nachum, maybe... God wants you to experience the difficulties of being in prison yourself firsthand. 
he may have orchestrated this whole scenario so that when you work on securing the release of Jewish prisoners, then you fulfill your mission with an even greater amount of alacrity. Especially now that you have felt upon your own self, your own body, the pain and difficulties of being imprisoned. Rav Nachum thought about what his student had told him, and he agreed. Later, after his student had left, he went to the door of his cell and pushed on it. Huh. And to his surprise, it opened. Miraculously, he walked right through the prison. Somehow, every one of the guards were asleep, and all the doors were unlocked. He was a free man, but he had learned his lesson. So too with Abramovino. His mission would be to offer hospitality to travelers. You know, the only way to really know what a traveler needs, what their needs are, is to be a traveler yourself. When you experience the difficulties of the road, then you can be a better host to your guests. Many times when people come to visit, you know, we, we start up long conversations, but we offer to take them sightseeing or other forms of entertainment. However, what they really want many times is just to take a nap or a shower, or maybe quick, catch a quick bite. Socializing may be the last thing they want or need now. The best way to know these things is to be a traveler yourself. Experience. You know, back in the 80s, our synagogue would travel to New York City on occasion and spend a Shabbat in Crown Heights. Our rabbi brought us there to experience a Shabbat with the local Hasidim. But most of us came to be able to hear and see the Lubavitcher Rebbe of blessed memory and to receive his blessing. Now, the residents of Crown Heights were, were very hospitable. They would open up their hearts and their homes and welcome us in for the Shabbat. It just so happened that we stayed at the same couple's house twice. When we came into their home the second time, the man of the house greeted us with the words, Welcome home. You know, it really warmed my heart. Now, whenever we have guests whom we have hosted before in our house, I always greet them with the same words, Welcome home. After all, if it made me feel good, I was sure that it would make someone else feel good as well. Nothing is an accident. We read about the life of Yosef. The Torah tells us that Yaakov loved him more than any of his other brothers. The verse in the beginning of the portion of Ayeshev states that Yosef was a ben zakunim, a child of his old age. Now the word zakin, elder, in Hebrew is a term that is used to signify that an individual is a scholar. In fact, the Hebrew word for zakin can be broken up into the words zeh shekona chokma, he who has acquired wisdom. The Medrash tells us that Yaakov spent 14 years teaching Yosef all that he had learned in the yeshiva of Shem and Aver. Again, the Medrash tells us that before Yaakov went to Lovin's house to find a wife, he prepared himself by spending 14 years studying under the tutelage of Aver. He did this so that he would have the spiritual muscle to be able to not only survive, but flourish, though he would be living in a secular environment together with his evil and devious father-in-law, Laban. Now, unbeknownst to Yaakov, he was preparing his beloved son Yosef for his journey and mission in life. Without realizing it, Yosef now possessed all the tools that he would need to succeed in his role as a slave, a prisoner, and a world leader. The lessons that his father had taught him gave him the knowledge and strength of character to overcome all the challenges that he would have to contend with during their separation. You know, much like the Jewish nation when they left Egypt, somehow, when it came to building the tabernacle, the house of God, the verse states that whatever they needed for its construction, they found in their tents. And so to Yosef, though he was only a 17-year-old boy when he was sold into slavery in Egypt, he was able to find within himself all the attributes and answers to questions that he would need to succeed in his mission. As you read about the incident with Potiphar's wife, it was the vision of his father that prepared before him, that helped him to succeed in his greatest moment of temptation. Another example of this concept is Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher. 
the greatest prophet that ever lived. All the events in his life were played out like a symphony. Nothing, nothing was an accident. He was groomed from the moment of birth for his ultimate mission of taking the Jews out of Egypt, serving as their king, and then leading them through the wilderness for 40 years. All that he needed to know about leadership, royalty, and the skills of warfare were all taught to him as a prince in the house of Paro. It is said that a person cannot be a leader in the place where he grew up as a child. So God orchestrated that Moshe was forced to run for his life after he killed the Egyptian overseer. The nation was not yet ready for redemption. So God took Moshe on a journey, one that would groom him for his ultimate mission. And when the time was right, God would bring him full circle, whereby he would then succeed in bringing the nation out of their oppressive slavery. Again, nothing is an accident. We see the snare repeating itself with the life of King David. Though he was a man of many talents, a warrior, a poet, a musician, and a scholar, his greatest attribute may well have been his humility. Again, we see that God was grooming him for his mission from the moment of his birth. His father did not recognize him as his own flesh and blood. He was ostracized by his brothers, looked upon as an illegitimate child. His father sent him into the fields to shepherd the sheep so as to keep him out of the public eye. As King David, David writes about himself in Psalm 118.22, the stone which the builders disdained has become the chief cornerstone. It wasn't until Shmuel Hanavi, Samuel the prophet, came to anoint a king that there was now some recognition that David was special with his own unique mission. He served God with all of his talents, but what he gave us was the greatest gift of all, Tehillim, Psalms, words that express pain, sorrow, and disappointment of a man who would become a great king, but at the same time, he gives us hope and joy through our connection to our Father in heaven. Now, even though he was a king, he taught us how to accept responsibility for our misdeeds. When he was confronted by Nusan Anavi, by Nusan the prophet, after his affair with Bathsheba, all he said was one word, Chatasi, I have sinned. You know, there were answers, excuses that he could have mentioned, but all he did was acknowledge his sin. It was not a momentary declaration. We read in Tehillim 51.3 where he states, For I know my transgressions and my sin is before me always. Life had taught him humility, and he never forgot the lesson. You know, they tell a story of Bar Barzillai, who was a shepherd boy that grew up with David. Barzillai came to visit David in Yerushalayim. Since they were boyhood friends, David rolled out the red carpet and treated him as if he were royalty. After a week, Barzillai came to say his goodbyes to David. David told him, well, there's really no need for him to leave. He could stay with him in the palace indefinitely. But Barzillai said, you know, he was a shepherd and that the city life was really not for him. So David said he understood but he asked him if there was something that he had wanted to do that he had not experienced. And Barzillai said there was, there was one thing that he had missed. He told David the two of them had not shared a meal together. Hearing this, David led Barzillai to a room in the back of the palace. He took out a key and unlocked the door. As the door opened, Barzillai saw that the room contained only a, a simple wooden chair and a small plain wooden table. On the table, he saw a dried piece of bread and a glass of water. The glass was only half full. He looked at David with a questioning gaze. David told him, this is what I eat. Well, Barzili was shocked. He asked him, only a dry piece of bread and only a half a glass of water? Why not a full glass of water? And David answered him, the glass was not filled with water. He said it was filled with his tears. The greater the man, the greater the humility. David had been groomed for his position from the moment of birth. Nothing, nothing is an accident. 
You know, I'm certain that if we all look back in our lives, that we can all tell similar stories. The things we thought we would do, <laughs> the places we thought we would be. I think that we're all like the little child sitting in the car seat in the back of a vehicle. You know, his little car seat has a steering wheel attached to it. And he may actually think that he's driving the vehicle. But we know better. He is at best a passenger. And so too, we are only our only passengers in this world. It is God who is the driver. GPS, God positioning satellite. Nothing, nothing in life is an accident. And let us hope and pray that he is taking us on our final journey with the coming Mashiach Sikainu. May he come quickly and in our time.